dawn. A smelter's legacy revealed. In Copper Mountains, one last load before home. One last delivery to factories still silent in the morning light. Shift change in Ohio, on a road where thousands will soon pass. Going to work. A million four hundred thousand Canadians and Americans. Members of a union. Going to work. Going to the picket line to seek fairness when compromise fails. Going to plant gates to fight for their rights. To support their friends. But mainly, going to work. To make a living. To build a better life. This is their story, the story of the United Steelworkers of America. For many who come to work this morning, like these new employees at Kaiser Aluminum Shell Met Plant, have questions about what a union is, about how it operates, questions that will be answered this day in an orientation program that will introduce them to their union and the people who built it. At this time, I'd like to welcome you to the greatest union in the world, the United Steelworkers of America. I'm about to present you with a new membership kit. I hope you glance through it and get a lot out of it. The new membership kit they received this morning describes the rights they will have as union members. Rights that are the fruits of a struggle that began before they were born. In the early 1930s, industrial workers were largely unorganized. In the steel industry, you accepted what the boss offered, if you wanted to keep your job. The industry's power was immense. Giant corporations owned the coal mines, the iron ore mines, the processing facilities, the ore boats, and the steel mills. Working conditions were often dangerous. Wages were seldom raised and sometimes arbitrarily lowered, though the industry employed almost a half a million men and women who often worked in small groups or alone, isolated and faced with determined opposition from management. Steel workers found it difficult to organize. But organized they did. In 1936, the Steelworkers Organizing Committee was formed as part of the CIO's attempt to organize millions of industrial workers during the Great Depression. Steelworkers were committed to represent all workers, led by Philip Murray. And meeting in fields outside plant gates, organizers spread the union message, undaunted by the weather. The struggle was long, but in the end, it was successful. In five years, the Canadian and American organizing committees organized a half million workers in the steel industry. And the organizing continued in the aluminum industry, in copper, in can plants, in the chemical industry. Workers joined the committee that became the largest industrial union in North America. Today, the United Steel Workers of America represent a million four hundred thousand workers. Steel workers work in mining, in all phases of metal fabrication, from the final product to the beginnings in the furnace and the smelter.
steel workers don't just work in mines and mills. Steelworkers have always directly elected their leaders, leaders to represent them in a process that is the heart of trade unionism. Those of us on the union side of the bargaining table look at the process of collective bargaining as a, uh, an effective way to deal with problems. And that's the press are here today because collective bargaining is a major American institution an institution that brings representatives of labor and management together to resolve their differences. Collective bargaining is a process that works. At the International Union's headquarters, sophisticated data processing equipment helps elected officials not only bargain the union's 6,300 contracts, but organizes them into groups based on industry similarities. Called coordinated bargaining, the process offers both union and management a way to make the bargaining process more efficient. Collective bargaining isn't just a national activity. Every year, hundreds of union bargaining committees sit down with their employers at the local level to solve problems. You can't agree with that. Who would you have come in and do that job? Call one out. That's right. And then how, like how, is that, how does that differ from the Mason group? What you're doing, you're, you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> <laughs> to me, management don't never, uh, ever get soft. You know, you just got to stay in there and knock heads with them and, uh, you know, try and force your way through issues. Sometimes you got to give a little to get a little, you know. But sometimes there are issues the two sides can't agree on. When that happens, workers have a legal right to strike. Strikes are infrequent today, compared with the past. During the organizing in the 1930s, there were no collective bargaining laws. Newsreels unfairly showed workers marching not for fair wages and decent working conditions, but against society itself. Without the protection of the law, striking workers were at the mercy of the police and hired guards, a situation that sometimes produced violence. But the situation has improved. Today in the United States and Canada, when union members vote to strike, they are exercising a legal right to withhold their labor until a compromise is reached. What time is it? A strike like this one at a shipyard in Virginia is because compromise is sometimes hard to achieve. When that happens, steel workers do not walk alone. They are backed by the Steel Workers Strike Fund. A million four hundred thousand steel workers contribute to the fund each month. So it is there when they need it. We had our utilities, our basic necessities taken care of, our medicine, all our medical bills were taken care of. In the end, the process works. Ninety-nine percent of all steel worker contracts are successfully bargained day in and day out without a strike. Contracts that provide union members with fair wages, including automatic cost of living protection, reasonable benefits, health insurance, decent pensions and job security provisions. Contracts that are fair to both labor and management. At the gates of an unorganized shipyard in the south, 30 steelworker volunteers pass out union literature as the morning shift arrives. It is a scene repeated many times across the country each year. But not all steelworker organizing happens in mills. Long thought to be unorganizable, today's office workers are seeking the benefits of a union. We 
still made it on time. <laughs> Before the steel workers came to Thoroughfare, we really didn't have the benefits that we have now. We had a lot of turnover. A lot of the girls left because there was not really any incentive to stay. There was uh, not really much chance for promotion. You were pretty much stuck in the job you're in when you were hired. And that's all changed since the steel workers came. It's become a nicer place to work. When the steel workers first came and talked to us, we all felt the same way. You know, you think of steel workers, you think of people in the mill. You don't think of people in an office. But as we checked into it, we found out they had their office and technical division. And it was a good division. And it's a growing division. And uh, we felt that they would take care of our needs better than any other group. And we've been right. They've done a good job for us. We hereby dedicate this office. There is much left to do. A steel worker office opens in Richmond to reach 75,000 unorganized chemical workers. In Canada's west, steel workers seek to organize the Canadian affiliates of major multinational corporations. There is an urgency in the work, for major economic change is in the air. In Toronto, the issue is the cause of a strike. I got 27 years in here, and uh, they just walk away and, and leave me, and uh, offer me no job whatsoever. All we want is a guarantee that the, uh, that the plant, uh, they do have to move, that uh, our contract will go with them, and we'll be offered jobs. The times are hard. Many of North America's industrial plants are obsolete and uncompetitive in the world market. And when plants are rebuilt, they often move, sometimes out of the country, leaving thousands to face the fate of the workers at this zinc plant in Pennsylvania. Just before Christmas, the plant closed, without any warning, throwing all but a handful of 1,200 employees out of work. With no voice in management, the union was powerless to stop the closing. The locals' officers invite their international union president here today to see the emptiness and discuss the future. When you look at this equipment and see how it's deteriorating and the maze of uh, controls, uh, you just have to wonder what it would take to put it back in operation again. I think it would be almost impossible to start it up again. I think most of the motors and what have you have all been disconnected and oh, yeah. the controls probably removed. When you see an empty locker room like this following uh, what we've seen out in the plant, uh, it's, uh, it's got to raise a question about uh, the last day. At the end of their tour, they listen to their president talk about one source of the problem and its solution. And again, I, I'm convinced that it has to be uh, increased activity in Washington to change our trade laws so that at least we're evidence the proper concern for, for workers in this country. We're the only free market left in the world where other countries can ship their unemployment to us uh, by discounting and subsidizing uh, their products in order that their people might stay employed while we deal with unemployment here. In Pittsburgh, the International Secretary meets with North American and Japanese union leaders to seek a solution to the plant closing problem. Miata and Brother Seto and Brother Nakamura, Brother Rebhan and others who have traveled far and are returning to our city for another visit. International trade is, of course, the heart of the question, or more correctly, of a variety of questions, at least as they impact in various ways on all of us in this room. When the Japanese turn came, they spoke of problems shared by the others. America, Japan, and, and, States, States, Canada, and Canada, uh, we, we face very serious unemployment, economic recession. There would be no easy answers here. In a Pennsylvania foundry, after a series of local labor disputes threatened the plant's health, management and the union sat down to work out personnel problems together. So that she succeeds. If she fails, then the whole program will work down the drain. Item number two on the agenda, the, discuss the harassment in the plants. Some of the guys seem to think this is uh, discriminatory. Do you have specific examples of what you're talking about? Bill is more aware of what's going on down there, and, and uh, we've had to sift out these different problems and decide on whether they're... The local union president spoke of the union's commitment 
to fairness. We started a program where uh, the company and the union got together and started to set down some sort of guidelines on reaching some objectives fair to both parties. Steelworkers face another problem, one that not only threatens their jobs, but their lives, for their work is often dangerous. In thousands of workplaces, like this mill in Pennsylvania, local union safety committees conduct regular inspections to learn where the dangers exist. clinics, the union monitors its members' health, seeking to identify problems before they make others sick, before they kill someone. Very good. Open your mouth. Just stick your tongue out. Okay, back in. It is a difficult problem, for there are some workplaces management says are too costly to clean up, forcing workers to choose between their jobs and their health. It is a choice that no one should have to make. It is a choice that makes them angry. The attitude of the company is for $25, we'll fix it. If it costs over that, don't talk to us right now. We're busy. This is their attitude. They don't seem to care a whole lot that in 10 years this might kill us. <laughs> the cost is sometimes high, leaving families and friends with only memories. Not only was he deeply involved with the church and the movement here, he was still concerned about people. And he involved himself in the labor union. But A.Q. talked about his labor movement. He talked about the union, talked about his concern for the betterment of workers. Huh? Because he was a laboring man. This I can admire him for. A.Q. Evans worked 28 years in an Indiana lead smelter. As president of his local, he led the steel workers' fight for a tougher lead standard, testifying even when sick, fighting on until March 15, 1979. A.Q. Evans died from complications due to lead poisoning. A.Q. Evans did not fight alone. In Washington, other steel workers marched to back their union as it fights for their health and safety in a Senate hearing room. In our statement, we wish to inform this committee. On one side, the sponsor of a bill to weaken OSHA. As it relates to OSHA. On the other, a steel worker representative testifying to save a law that workers depend on. I, uh, if we can limit it and define it in terms of 5%, uh, I see no problem. Senator, I think, you know, we, we've had the hearings now going on quite a long time, and I think uh, the statistics are beginning to come through that the explanations of the clogging up of the, the inspection system is based upon really a, a, a bad misinterpretation of what other than serious citations are, Senator. In Ontario's provincial legislature, another steel worker who sits here as an elected member raises the same concerns in another way. Question of the uh, question of the Minister of Labor. Is the Minister aware that in the United Steelworkers attempt to trace a list of 100 workers at the old Hampco Coke Oven operation in Hamilton, that out of 35 workers they've been able to trace to date, 27 have died of cancer? And I got into politics very early when I realized that the companies had more influence than we've had. Uh, we just haven't seen to it that some of our people, with their concerns, uh, get themselves elected to the House of Parliament where you do debate and you do pass the laws. Effective political action has been crucial for unions since the beginning. For in the 1930s, union support of Franklin Roosevelt for president made possible the passage of the Wagner Act, the law that legalized the right of unorganized workers to form unions, establishing the process of collective bargaining. Election Day in the United States and Canada. 
steel workers exercise their political rights. At a local union phone bank, a retired steel worker spoke of the difference getting involved can make. An individual can volunteer his services to the, uh, to the, through the local union on registration to get the uh, uh, people membership, and not only the membership, but all of his friends and neighbors uh, registered so that they'll be eligible to vote. It can make a big difference, either uh, electing your friends or uh, letting your enemies be elected. Unless you have that participation, that's what's going to happen. That's what does happen. Hi, right, good afternoon. I'm here to take you to the polls. Are you ready to go? But not all steelworker retirees are able to get out on their own this morning. Isolated, often living alone, they have not been forgotten by their union. This will be used somewhat as a prototype. For the steelworkers have taken the lead to provide for the needs of retirement through the Steelworkers Old Timers Foundation. A non-profit corporation, the foundation provides retired steel workers with decent housing, places to have a meal and live each day to the fullest. Retired workers are also found at union halls, which serve as community centers for other senior citizens to join friends and to share common interests. But the heart of the union's work is less dramatic. In thousands of locker rooms around the country, local union leaders meet to solve their members' problems through the grievance procedure. These local officers prepare for a grievance hearing to help a worker threatened with firing because he made a mistake. Sir, I can't believe that Warren Wilson deliberately operated the machine not knowing the pen was in. In Calgary, steel workers argue a similar case in a grievance hearing with management. That's the investigation report this there. Is our investigation report right here. I'd like to rest the committee to look at that. Take a look at that. We're just we're going to have to dismiss Gary, and I don't think. Uh, we have any other choice. Requiring evidence and due process, the grievance procedure offers workers a fair way to solve their problems. Night shifts, when it happened, he should have been left on day shift during good lighting conditions. He wasn't experienced on that machine. Another fact is the machine had faulty brakes. Faulty brakes? It had faulty brakes. It's been reported to maintenance twice. The business of the union has become complex, making education a high priority. We have an engineer 20 years, a graduate of U of T in this city. Right. He yep. can tell you about the uh, dust. In this classroom, Canadian steel workers participate in a mock confrontation with management on health issues. Guidelines and this company would be better off. Fix it up. How are you going to clean it up? Never mind, fix it up. Well, we don't feel that it needs cleaned up that much. The idea is to recreate the conditions of a real union management meeting to learn what they could do better. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Can I please have the real industry, real industry says heard. we must produce? At the Steelworkers Education Center at Linden Hall in western Pennsylvania, other steelworkers learn skills that range from international affairs to collective bargaining to federal regulation. The company has a responsibility to provide a safe and a healthy place for you to work. There comes a time to stop. A time to put away the tools and safety equipment. family and fun, a break 
a meal at Linden Hall, a chance to find out what is really happening. In Louisiana, it's time for a cookout called a jambalaya. <laughs> so I had to worry about stirring the hole, hold on this. Got the lid. There's the lid right there. It's got to go in too. Can we get in there with this? Yeah, we're going to squeeze it. Play ball! In Indianapolis, two steelworker locals engage in a little friendly competition. As the day ends, steel workers gather in local union halls to conduct their union's business through the democratic process. In another hall, the process is the same, for democracy is a steel worker tradition. Every two years, thousands of elected steel worker delegates come together to establish their union's policies, to set their union's course. Here, every delegate has a right to a voice in the affairs of their union led by international officers directly elected by the union's membership and guided by the delegates at this convention. The United Steelworkers of America is a truly democratic institution with many faces, many voices. Well, I think the Steelworkers is about the best union going, really. I think it's one of the most democratic unions that's ever been in existence. The only way you have uh, any rights at all you go in and punch a time clock is to have the union with you and behind you. I think without a union, we'll never have anything. We'll always be second-class workers. As long as we can work together, and you know, as a large number, then we can achieve the goals that we set. Sometimes you get real discouraged, you do. But generally when that happens, you find out there's people up there that's still behind you and they're still supporting you, and they renew your faith in them. I mean, there's nothing to be afraid of. You have a union. You have people that care. You don't have to be afraid of anything. 